Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Ball Capture back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers Podcast. I have another guest today. Her name is Jenny Powers. She's a PhD immunologist, I believe. And That's correct. She has recently released a book, I believe, called On the Origin of Being. And I think I reached out to her because I saw something and it kind of really resonated with me because as the people who listen to this podcast know, I'm always talking about how we are these adaptive organisms. We either are working from a homeostatic state or an allostatic state. And when I saw the the release and I saw something written up about it, I'm like, I think that's somebody who really gets what I'm trying to convey. So Jenny, welcome to the Thyroid Answers podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I, I do think your your instinct was right. I think we'll have a lot to talk about homeostasis and adaptation and things like that. So so I'm excited. Let's start with who the heck is Jenny Powers PhD to begin with? And why why are we why should everybody listen to what you're saying? Yeah. Well, um, as you said, I got my PhD in immunology um in the mid 2000s Um, and I really enjoyed studying the human body and understanding all the, the miracle amazingness that our body can do. Um, but I so we had started to feel some of this um disconnect, I guess, um, the way we were working, I was depressed, you know, I wasn't exercising as I, as much as I should. And I was just not in a good state of mind. Plus I had this dream of becoming a writer. Um, and so when I had my first child, I thought this would be a really good time to get off the academic track and pursue writing. Um, but what was crazy is I was, I was writing middle grade fiction, which is eight to 12 year old fiction. Um, because that's what called to me. Um, and so, so, but I really missed the science and I missed being able to use what I'd been trained for so many years for. So, but as, as you know, writers don't make a lot of money. So I was looking for a part-time job and I found Luke, my co-author who, um, had this, he had an ad looking for someone to help him with one of his other books about nutrition. He was looking for a nutritionist. But I thought that I could totally do this work because I know how to do research. I know how to write things. Um, and so we started our interview and he the first thing he said was, oh, I already found a nutritionist. So I was like, really? Oh, my gosh, what's going on? But then he said, but I have this other idea that ties into my work with nutrition because his journey started with nutrition. Um, and as he studied the evolution of nutrition, he realized that there are all of these other ways that we live all the ways of being that we are no longer living a core in accord to our evolutionary um, selves. And so he'd had this idea for another book kicking around in his head for many, many years and just never had time to kind of bring it out. Um, and so I researched and wrote the book. I was able to, um, with his vision and structure and input, we created this book together. Um, and I like to think that People, you know, why should people listen to me? I'm I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not an anthropologist. But when I started this project, um, it resonated with me because I'd felt this disconnect that that I something was just off. I was not happy. I was not healthy. And when I started doing the research, it was a blank slate for me too. It was like someone starting to read the book. Um, and so as I wrote the book, I learned so much about the evolutionary journey. And then I learned so much about my own health and how I could change that I kind of feel like the process of writing this book prepared me to be able to talk to somebody who's going to who's going to read this book because I went through the same steps that they did. Um, and so that was several years ago. And then there was COVID. But this past year, we're, um, you know, we, we brought it back up and we we're ha doing hybrid publishing with Greenleaf. And it came out at the beginning or the end of June. And so it's just been a wild ride since then. So give us some insight as to like, what's the, what's the basis of the book, the foundational concepts of the book? Okay. Well, kind of one of the main foundational concepts is the concept of the evolutionary mismatch. And that's because the environment that we live in today is so radically different from the one that we evolved in. Um, and it's changing so rapidly that our bodies have not had a chance to adapt and evolve to this modern world. Um, so basically, I like to say that we're still running hunter-gatherer software 
um, and the hardware, you know, the environment around us uh, is it looks nothing like what our hunter gatherer software was developed to to address. And so, when humans live in accord with their evolutionary design, in our evolutionary history, we were hunter gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years, and it was a uh, we lived in equilibrium with the environment. Um, and we didn't have the physical and mental health issues that we have now. And when, but when we live in discord, we experience the pathology. And, and yes, you know, when we were hunter gatherers, we had disease and we had accidents and there were all kinds of things, but we didn't have the diseases of modernity. Hunter gatherers did not suffer from heart disease or diabetes or hypertension um, because they were living in accord with their biology. And because they had the state of well-being, the state of homeostasis, um, the, the, you know, very strong homeostatic drive to kind of get back to baseline, they kind of lived in a dynamic state of health. Yes, they'd get sick and they would recover. Yes, they would get tired and they would recover. Um, they would get injured and they recover if, you know, if it was something that they could recover from. Um, so kind of the basis of, of this book is we don't want to go back to being hunter-gatherers, but there are so many things that we can learn from our evolutionary journey, starting even with the single cells billions of years ago that can we can bring into the modern world. And because we are adaptive beings, we have really smart brains, we don't have to wait for our bodies to evolve in order to cope with the world. We can change our behavior, we can change our lifestyle, and looking back and understanding how we got here will probably, hopefully, help people understand the reasons why, you know, people are telling them to eat whole foods or to get up when the sun rises, get sun in the morning. There's so many different things that are evolutionarily uh, preserved. Um, so hopefully people can understand the why and that will make the the how so much easier. So what do you think is the biggest challenge? Because you always hear people who have chronic health issues saying, at least in the in the functional medicine space and integrative space is, hey, we have to find the root cause. In allopathic medicine, which is probably more of what you grew up in, if you had your PhD in immunology, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about the external thing makes us sick, right? It's the bacteria that makes us sick. It's the toxin that makes us sick. It's the mold that makes us sick. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is that's probably not as true, because if we do have a robust and strong immune system, we come in contact with organisms and we re recover, right? We get exposed, mm -hmm. we recover. We get exposed, recover. And it's these chronic exposure, you know, intermittent chronic exposures to things that actually makes our immune system stronger, not weaker, right? If we, mm -hmm. if we, if we live in a, in a bubble and don't get any exposure to anything, we don't get stronger, we don't get right. bitter, we don't get more strength to our immune system. So as you're writing this book and you're talking about this evolutionary mismatch, what are the factors today that you think lead to our bodies not being able to hope? Um, I, I think it is the, the, the structure of how our world, how our culture is constructed around us um, and how fast that structure is changing. Um, because even though at, at the start of the agricultural revolution, our lifestyle changed dramatically, but people still, you know, gathered food or, you know, produced food and they worked outside and they were more in touch with the, the environment and they went, they went to bed when the sun went down and they woke up when the sun was up. So our diet changed, but our lifestyle kind of stayed a little bit more the same. And then in the industrial revolution, the rapid industrialization, the move from rural to urban, um, the the move from the way that we worked, bending, you know, walking, running, lifting, reaching, to sitting in a in a stationary spot, um, the food, it we got we the industrial revolution made ultra processed food possible. We always ate whole food until the industrial revolution came along. We might not have been eating, you know, the right food and the right ratios after the agricultural revolution. But after the industrial revolution, we started eating pure sugar, pure flour without any of the other parts of the wheat, um, processed um, vegetable oils and things like that. So things that our body had never really encountered. Um, 
trans fats that that's a good one you know we we as humans manufactured and made up trans fats and we were eating it and our bodies are like what the heck's going on you know artificial colors artificial flavors these are things that we didn't start to consume until after the industrial revolution so you know it started off with the agricultural revolution and then the, this industrial revolution the movement to cities the we're no longer involved in our food production uh, and we rely on companies and industry to stock the shelves of the supermarket. And then we also rely on, you know, people just to tell us what's healthy and what's not. And there's really no regulation, you know, to be like, oh, this is healthy. Or um, they market things to us as if we need them, as if this is going to be great. That this, you know, they they add sugar, they add oil, they add things that make it really hyper palatable to us. Um, and so we're we're just no longer connected with the way our food gr has grown, the way we used to sleep, the way we used to work, the way we used to be with nature, because this the acceleration of progress. So I think what you're saying ties in a lot with what I say in on the podcasts, on the books, is that we have, there's foundational concepts that help us achieve a certain level of health. We have to have emotional fitness. We mm -hmm. need to have physical fitness. We have to have dietary fitness. We have to have sleep fitness, respiratory fitness. Mm -hmm. We have to have metabolic fitness. We need a high level of fitness in all of these categories to be healthy. And if we don't do those things, we have a low level of physical fitness because we sit all day. If we have poor dietary fitness because we eat a lot of processed food, if we have poor emotional fitness because we're sitting in front of our social media accounts all day and checking out what everybody's perfect life is that we don't have, right? If we're listening to today's political commentary, right, all the time and taking that in, um, all of these things have taken us away from how we used to be. We used to be physically active. We used to get up in the mm -hmm. sun. We used to farm our own food. We used to kill our own animals and harvest mm -hmm. them. And we didn't eat by because it's seven o'clock and 12 o'clock and six o'clock. We ate when we were hungry. And maybe sometimes we didn't eat when we were hungry. Mm -hmm. And when we had more food, we ate, we maybe we overate because we didn't know when we were going to get the next meal. So we didn't live by some set, set of rules. We mm -hmm. didn't stay up excessively late. We went to bed at, when it was dark because there wasn't, anything else to do right and there was no electricity <laughs> right and so uh, obviously none of us want to go back there but those those key habits that we need to have have become behaviors and the bad behaviors that we could have gotten away with before because we had such good habits have now become the habit so we have a lot of bad habits mm -hmm. lifestyle style and dietary habits and a few good health behaviors that doesn't sit well with our physiology and winds up creating a lot of what we now call chronic health issues and chronic illness. Mm -hmm. So are you, does that make sense to you? Oh, I, I would totally agree. Um, I, I heard you say in another podcast that the you know, diet lifestyle environment are kind of the three keys to developing chronic illness, to developing thyroid dysfunction and None of those things are as they used to be, and our bodies don't know what to do with that. Um, so at, like you were saying, you know, we, we, we try to adapt, but our bodies can only adapt to a certain point. We have to start because because we don't have time to evolve, you know, in the next 50 years, we're not going to evolve suddenly to be able to handle 150 pounds of sugar a year per person. Um, but if we can um, like take some of those things and bring them, bring them back. I, I totally agree. So I, we talked about this from the homeostasis and allostasis perspective. And sometimes people, when we think about, hey, we're, we, there's a lot of things we do or things that happen to us that put stress on their system and people want to live in a stress-free world and environment. And while, A, it's not going to happen, right. it's also not healthy for us, right? We do need a certain level of stress on our physiology. That's what helps us to some degree over time adapt and change. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the problem with nowadays, you know, that the if we have a homeostasis line, you know, we have challenges or things that we have to let, you know, we, we deviate from that line, but then we have to adapt and adjust our behavior or strengthen our bodies or whatever. But then we always are able to return to that homeostasis. 
The problem nowadays is whenever there's a stress, it's compounded with another stress and another stress. And then we eat and then we eat more, more and we're eating bad food. And so we're never able to return to homeostasis. Um, and I think uh, hopefully our book lays out for people that there is a way to, in this modern world, to return to that way of homeostasis. And it's because we are so intelligent and so smart. Our brains are so adaptable and so plastic and humans are so creative um, that we can actually change our behaviors to, to, mo to move back to that homeostatic dynamic equ equilibrium. So, but I think it's hard because like I said, you, like you said there, you know, we have this culture and this is what we eat and this is when we eat and this is when we get up and this is how hard we work. And this is, how much we are inside and sitting in front of our TVs, you know, we can decide to change all that stuff, but it, but it's hard because there's not a lot of structure to help people who are looking for a new way. There kind of has to be a grassroots movement. I think in order for big corporations and governments to change in order to support kind of the kinds of things we're talking about, it needs to kind of come from the ground up. Problem. Do you think that maybe the problem is there's not much incentive? Well, I mean, change. I think having, you know, yes, our life expectancy is 78 years and it's, but it's actually declining and mm -hmm. that the life expectancy without chronic illness is maybe 62. And so I think people don't realize until it's too late that how you choose to live is going to affect not only how long you live, but how well you live. Mm -hmm. Um, and so hopefully more and more people will be able, you know, before it's too late, but even, even after getting a chronic illness, there, our bodies can heal themselves so well that someone who has a chronic illness can change and, and change their diet and lifestyle and their environment and, and actually mitigate a lot of the stuff that the chronic illness was, was causing. So I think there's great incentive, but I think people aren't necessarily listening for it or they're just too caught up in the modern world to really even think about it. You know, it's the modern world is shiny, like, oh, there's Netflix, oh, there's this, there's that. There's all these things that that take our attention and we're not paying attention to ourselves. And we're not even really thinking about how how we are gonna be in the future, how our bodies are gonna be. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I, I think there's incentive to have healthier habits. The problem becomes, for the individual is that they're probably, oftentimes there isn't an incentive to do those things because they're uncomfortable. No, you're, you're like a fish swimming upstream because everybody else is doing the opposite. Exactly. And two, yeah. if yeah. everybody's doing else is doing the opposite and you're getting along okay, right? And you start looking around at your peers and they're all about the same level of health or unhealthy that you are, where's the problem? Right. So there is an incentive to change because this is my peer group. This is everybody I hang out with. They're all they're all doing the same thing. But I also think there's not a huge incentive for different industries to make change. Right. Big food. There's no huge incentive oh. for big food to change. There's in there's no incentive for big media to change. Right. There's no incentive for big pharma to change. Mm -hmm. What we've actually done is create a perfect environment for these big three big industries to thrive and survive. We make a Franken food that's unhealthy, but we promote it. Um, because we need to promote it, we put it on big media who makes money from marketing it. Mm -hmm. And then we've created an industry <laughs> instead of what we used to do maybe decade, you know, decades ago, which was try and fix the problem. Now we manage conditions and now we've got big pharma who's making tons and tons of money managing chronic health conditions. So there isn't really an, an incentive from big industry, big media, big pharma to change. So I, I totally agree. It's going to have to be a more, more grassroots type of thing where people get frustrated and say, all right, this, this is not good enough. And usually we have to have our own health issues or health crisis. Some of us are are very motivated on our own to try and maintain a higher level of health. And many times it's because we've seen a family member, or a loved one have poor health. And we're like, I don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. But 
when we when we're on social media, when we're on TV, and we're being blasted by uh, disease as a normalcy, like this is normal. Everybody's got pancreatic insufficiency. Everybody gets needs to dance and sing and talk about their you know their A one C on TV, right? This has become <laughs> the norm. Like you almost, yeah. If you're not in the club, something's wrong. Right. So I think that's how I look at when I say that I don't think there's incentive that generally I don't think there's incentive. I think the incentive mm -hmm. is let's keep everybody listening to the noise around them. And we don't often spend enough time listening to our own physiology because we're so mm -hmm. busy. And I think sometimes people don't want to listen to their what goes on in their own brain, their own mind, mm -hmm. their own they want body. To be distracted. Absolutely. And as long as you're busy being distracted, you don't have to pay attention to those things. But right. then all of a sudden, when chronic illness hits, then you're going like, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, this isn't this isn't good. I'm not sure how I got here. It was probably just, you just, I don't want to be mean, but we're not paying attention. No, we're not. And that's something we, we talk about in the book, something that our ancestors did very well is always live in the present moment and they listened to what's going on around them and they listened to their bodies and it was a survival mechanism because if they're sitting there you know thinking about the future or thinking about you know the you know game of thrones last night and not paying attention to what's going on they were in danger you know they had to keep they had to be alert and you know they they listened to their bodies if if you're hungry, you ate. This is this is something like you said. If you're hungry, you ate. If you're tired, you slept. Um, if you were sick, you didn't work. Uh, you, you know, there are all of these things that that we just mask. We we don't even you know we feel tired at at the right time because the sun went down, our melatonin production starts. But then we're staring at our screens all day, all all evening, and so it trick it tricks us into thinking the sun's still up, and so melatonin production you know, gets delayed and delayed and delayed. And then we can't, when you finally put our screens down and turn off the lights, we wonder why we can't fall asleep. And then because we can't fall asleep and our circadian rhythms are all messed up, we can't wake up in the morning. Um, so there are all of these things that, um, yeah, we just have to learn to listen to our bodies and actually do it. Like when I started doing this, it was really hard for me to be like, I have to go to bed right now even though I really wanted to watch another episode of my favorite show, right? Mm -hmm. I would have to like say, I have to turn this off or, it, but now it's like, okay, when it becomes a certain time of evening, I'm getting ready for bed. I'm going to bed because I wake up at the same time every morning now. And if I don't go to bed when I'm supposed to, and I wake up at the same time every morning, I have a sleep deficit. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not always able to take a nap the next day. Um, so we really have to shift into stop being distra so distracted our the modern world just keeps it's just so full of distractions and so full of things that make us not have to live in our own bodies or in our own heads that's one of the first things that needs to change i think yeah there's a, a book that came out by somebody in my space and i think it, i'm not i don't remember the title but it was essentially it was about intuitive eating right hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that person got blasted. I mean, they got put on blast mode because they're about intuitive eating, like how you how we you know you can't you can't rely on that. But I think it goes his I what he was trying to get across was if you're when your body's you we could be listening to the body when we're hungry we eat we don't eat by the clock we eat by what mm -hmm. we, what what our body's telling us and people were outraged. But part of the problem with that was and I understood understood part of it. I understood what he was trying to say, mm -hmm. but. The challenge is, as you were saying, we've become so disconnected with what our body's telling us and we don't realize. And we've in 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 days gone by, right? When we were hungry, we were truly hungry. We were needed nutrition. Unfortunately, today, people are hungry all the time because mm -hmm. of the obesity epidemic, massive levels of leptin and leptin resistance. So we can. A lot of people can't do intuitive nutrition because their brain is telling them they're always hungry, even though they just ate three pizzas and their, their mm -hmm. brain's going, Hey, I still need glucose. I'd still need glucose. I still need mm -hmm. glucose because they become leptin resistant. So this excessive load that we're putting on our system, physical stress from 
too much, too little physical activity, both can be problematic. The franken food and ultra processed foods that we're eating, um, the poor diet, poor sleep habits, all these things we've been talking about. Uh, unfortunately, even for some of those people that when they like, okay, I'm going to listen to my body, the cues are skewed because the body's adapt been in that adaptive state mm -hmm. and going into what we talked before a little bit off 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 camera that's allostatic overload the body is now bre breaking systems are breaking down and now we are in a, a malfunctioned or dysfunctioned state because we've been in this excessive stress state for so long so it is it's okay. a challenge so it, it, i guess it really is the question becomes like what where do we start like what does somebody need to learn about evolution and evolutionary behavior or habits that's going to help them start to turn their health around? Like, what do they, what do they need to know? What do they need to learn? Yeah, well, I, that, I mean, that's a really good question because there's lots of stuff that they can learn, but it also at the same time is overwhelming at people are like, oh, there's so much I don't know. There's so much I need to, you know, there's so much I need to do. And so it's easier to not do anything than to get started. Um, but one thing I, I kind of like to tie to evolution is that evolution changed our bodies incrementally and over time. They didn't all of a sudden, you know, didn't all of a sudden be like, boom, here we are. You know, th this is, this is humans. Um, you know, you're homo sapiens now. Um, it took small steps to see whether or not that small step worked. And then after that step worked, you take it took another small step. And if did that, did that step work? So for me, um, it's kind of like biohacking, right? You have to kind of like take small incremental steps and, and really pay attention to how all of these different modalities that you're doing, um, different exercise, different diet, um, different sleep patterns, um, see how they are affecting you before you move on to the next one. Um, so I, we also like to say that evolution was the original biohacker, um, because it actually, uh, evolution designed us to thrive in our environment, to have this dynamic state of equilibrium, um, and homeostasis. And so, um, we have to take this, take really small steps to, to, to create habits. And some of those steps, like you said, do, will require a reset and it's going to be uncomfortable until your body resets. So it's important not to take too many on at a time. And our book at the end of every chapter, this book covers sleep, uh, nutrition, work, and our relationship with nature. And so at the end of every chapter or at the end of every section, we have like really small actionable steps that you can do um, that will help. Uh, and, and, and also once you understand why we are telling you to take this step, maybe it'll be easier to integrate because you know the why. So let's break down those big, those big concepts that you talked about, that you talk about in the chapter. So which of those, which of those concepts do you think is the, the best place to start for somebody? Obviously it differs based on where somebody is in their life and their struggles right. and their load. But let's start. Let's start with sleep. Okay. What, what? What? A lot of people think that they do that they sleep. I think I sleep fine. I don't have any sleep issues. How big of a problem is sleep in today's world? Um, it's. I think it's a huge problem. Um, people not only aren't getting enough sleep, but they're not getting the high quality sleep. Um. Humans actually evolved of all the great apes of all primates to have the most efficient, shortest amount of sleep possible because there's so many other things that we had to do as humans. We had to learn to socialize and create and in innovate and things like that. And so we actually have a really short amount of time that we normally sleep. Um, and if you study some of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, at least the ones who survived into modernity, they're, they didn't sleep 10, 12 hours a day they they slept eight, seven or eight hours a day. Um, and that is kind of what people recommend now. However, their sleep was very um, entrained with the light and dark um, cycles of our earth. Their circadian rhythms were very entrained with their environment. Um, so they were able to get hit that really deep um, restorative 
very concentrated sleep um, that we evolved to have. Um, and so they would go to bed after you know the sun went down and they wouldn't have any access to, to any kind of light except firelight. Um, and so then they would they would sleep and then they would wake up at the same time every morning. Uh, they'd get really, really bright light in the morning and that would kind of reset their circadian rhythms. Um, and and if they had a bad night's sleep, they took a nap, you know. Uh, but nowadays, we are not entrained with the environment. We are so isolated from any kind of trigger that helps our bodies with our circadian rhythms and our, the cycles, the, the day-night cycles of our bodies. Um, we don't have bright light in the morning. You know, we have this kind of low level, mid level of light throughout the entire day. You know, the sun goes down, we still have light throughout the entire day. So we are not getting the signals that our bodies need to start melatonin production, to start, you know, in the, in the evenings, to start cortisol, cortisol production in the mornings to try to, you know, it just gets so dysregulated. Um, so I think people, you know, need to look at their sleep and say, I'm getting seven hours of sleep, but how good is my sleep? Am, am I staying up till one in the morning and sleeping until eight? And am I looking at a screen till the, till the very last minute? And then when I wake up, do I even go outside and get light? Um, so there, there are ways to improve your quality of sleep um, and not necessarily, you don't necessarily need to improve the quantity of sleep unless you're chronically sleep deprived, you know, less than seven hours a night. So from a sleep perspective, Matthew Walker, others talk about somewhere around seven to eight hours is probably appropriate. Less than six hours is probably pretty significantly problematic. Um, they also talk about, and I read, I have a whole chapter in my book as well on sleep and the importance of it, but mm -hmm. um, timing, consistent time to bed, consistent time to get up, waking mm -hmm. with the sun, going to bed in the dark, right? Trying to limit the amount of artificial light in the evening. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to go, the timing becomes important and the consistency becomes important because if we go to bed too late, that affects how we, you know, download the data from, from the brain and try mm -hmm. and facilitate, you know, kind of coordinate and make sense of all that stuff. And if we wake up too early, that affects kind of the, 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 cleaning off the, the hard drive or the zip drive so that we can get more data the next day. So what are the, if somebody was to, what would be the general concepts that you would, or suggestions that you would give to somebody in the book as to, hey, here's the key strategies that you need or habits you start to need to put in play that start to improve your level of, and I'll steal my own term, your level of sleep fitness. What are those key mm -hmm. concepts that they need to start well, to do? Yeah, you you covered pretty much all of them. Um, consistent wake up time, um, bright light in the mornings, uh, decreased nighttime light pollution. Um, also, there's a couple of other things. You know, we we are so isolated from other kinds of triggers, not just light. But the falling temperature is also a really important um, feature of us getting sleepy and having good sleep because, you know, when the sun goes down and you're outside, it gets cooler. Um, but now we live in these, you know, air conditioned heated homes. And so turning down the temperature might be another way to help facilitate sleep. Um, and the, all of those things are basically because of the, the environment in which we evolved. These are the things that we encountered on a daily basis. Um, something else, I talked to um, Dr. David Sampson of the University of Toronto. He's a primatologist and does a lot of work on sleep. And when I interviewed him, he said, I asked him like, what's the number one thing if you were gonna tell somebody how to improve their sleep, what's the number one thing you would say? And it really surprised me because he said, stop problematizing sleep because we are so obsessed with sleep. We spend all this money on, on sleep products and all of these things. And he said, we're like in our own head about it a little bit. Um, when he studied these hunter gatherer groups, they didn't even know what insomnia was. Um, they, and they, and if they had insomnia, if they, you know, if they, they was described to them, they're like, Oh, I have that once or twice. You know, if they have a bad night's sleep, they, they do something about it. Um, and so, but, but it's, it's hard not to problematize sleep unless 
you're doing the things that hunter gatherers did in order to in ensure their sleep fitness, right? Um, because they're so entrained with the environment and all of those things that we've listed um, as good habits to have, they they don't worry about their sleep. Um, so he's like, he said that we need to understand the evolutionary basis behind our sleep patterns and, and our triggers for sleep. He also said that, you know, if, if we say, oh, I mean, I'm getting a bad night's sleep tonight, I'll take a nap tomorrow, or I'll try to get a little bit more sleep tonight. Um, rather than going, oh my God, I can't sleep. This is awful. I'm going to, you know, I, yeah, what's my sleep tracker say? Um, I wake up in the middle of the night, I have to check my sleep tracker, you know, um, just keep it more it doesn't have to be this complicated thing. It, they, they, these are very simple things that we can do. Um, and so hopefully, you know, sleep won't be, won't be a problem anymore. Yeah. I think sometimes we take micro problems and make them into macro problems. And then, yeah, exactly. right. And, and we do that with microaggressions and turn them into macro issues. So um, for the listener, I think, you know, all the things that like when we're talking about the hunter gatherer community, one of the things that's that probably allowed for them to, to sleep better, especially much better than we do today in general is they're pretty physically active. Right. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. sure you found that out. Right. Oh, um, yeah. And so as they're physically active, they're burning up energy. They're burning up ATP. And ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is you're eating food to convert food energy into cellular energy, ATP. And you probably, I don't know if you talk about this in your book, but as we break down the ATP, the base molecule of that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is adenosine. And adenosine is the sleep molecule. So these hunter-gatherers who are people who are physically active and busy all day, they are actually creating sleep pressure to get them to sleep. Right? Did you do you guys mm -hmm. talk about that in the book as we, part we of that evolutionary ATP, change? We we talk about ATP um, in the nutrition section. You know, the mm -hmm. cellular, you know, external food sources into cellular energy and the and the food ways. Um, we don't talk about the adenosine. That is really cool. So the, uh, the early hunter gatherer, I mean, and, and we do this when we're physically active, especially we're physically active in the cold, where we are not only burning up energy with physical activity, but we're burning up energy to try and keep warm, right? Yeah, like go, yeah. go swim, right? You do a lot of swim. You're going to be tired and exhausted. That's why these guys are drinking, eating 5,000, 7,000 calories because in the pool, your body temperature is dropping. So now you've got to heat your body and you're using physical activity and that creates all the adenosine. Adenosine binds to the molecules and helps <laughs> tell your brain you need to be in recovery mode. And then the, the adenosine binds to the receptors. It tells the brain, hey, we need to stay asleep. We need to rebuild, recover, recover the ATP, get these phosphate groups from our food, rebuild mm -hmm. the ATP molecules. The early cave man, early man and woman didn't have caffeine, right? Mm -hmm. And caffeine, everybody thinks caffeine is like, does a lot to like stimulate a lot of things, but really what caffeine is doing is blocking adenosine from binding to those receptors. So you still have the same amount of adenosine in the mm. system, but the caffeine is blocking the receptors. So we can, even if we're physically active, if we're consuming a lot of caffeine, which we do in what? Our energy drinks, our coffee, mm -hmm. our tea, like all these things, that the half-life of caffeine is like 12 hours. So now... Even if we're doing a lot of physical activity things, burning up and creating a lot of excess adenosine because we're chewing up the ATP, we're also consuming a lot of caffeine, which then prevents us from getting into that deep restorative sleep. Mm -hmm. And so now we wake up in the morning and we're tired and fatigued. Why? Because instead of replacing, rebuilding all those adenosines back into ATP, we wake up with a large percentage of adenosine. So mm -hmm. we're... I'm tired and I'm groggy and I'm sleepy. And now what do we do? Pile more caffeine in. Or we didn't we didn't evolve with all this stimulatory stuff. And we have so much more of it today than we ever mm -hmm. did. Yeah. I mean, I think caffeine is another way that we mask what our bodies are trying to tell us. Um, and we just 
we're basically like, oh, you know, I'm tired. I should go to bed. And then we, we, our brains just completely override the needs of our bodies. Nope. I got to work. Nope. Mm -hmm. I got it. And in order to work, because I'm so tired, I can't keep my eyes open. I have to drink caffeine. So it's just another way of masking our natural reactions to physical activity, to mental activity, to the falling sun, to all of these things. Um, we're just not listening. Yeah. And I, it's, it's not like these things are all separate from each other, right? Like we're going to talk right. about nutrition here in a second, no, but it's all intertwined together. <laughs> and that's the key. Like we're looking for this one thing that's causing the health crisis. There isn't a one thing, although it's mm -hmm. sexy to talk about the one thing, right. That's causing all the illness. It's sugar. It's cholesterol. Yeah. It's yeah. this, it's that when in reality, let's say it's the load, it's the lo almost for everybody. It's the load, not the thing. And if it was just the load, then everybody who eats sugar would have chronic health issues. And that's not the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it was just mold that caused everybody's illness, then everybody should be sick at the same time. It's the excessive load for extended periods of time. So we talk about sleep and and I'll reiterate this for the listeners. Like if you, do, if you want to do two things, right, that are going to improve that you should do before you take melatonin, before you do anything else. Increase your physical activity, reduce your caffeine. If you're going to have caffeine, do it early in the day. Keep in mind the half-life is 12 hours. And so you want to shorten that. Do those two things. Then the other things that that um, yeah, you talked about was, hey, down on your, down on the light exposure, your device things. I, mm -hmm. I talk about my book. I'm sure you guys talk about your book. Like you put this screen, the the light save, change mm -hmm. things that you could put on it. Yeah, where nice these, yeah, where are these cool glasses that change oh, yeah. right what goes my... on, right? They so they're they're you know they they don't look <laughs> as good on camera, right? But they're simple, easy things you can do. But too many of us reach for the bottle of something to put us into slumber, but that's not quality sleep. So mm -hmm. do these easy things. So I exercise, reduce the caffeine, reduce the artificial light, and Get off social media, especially in the last couple hours before you go to bed. Probably one of some of the best things you could do. But let's talk food. What's the problem okay. with today's food that's creating problems with health and well-being? How does what we eat, some people would say, we have the ability to feed more people because of all this wonderful technology we have. What's what's the what's the big issue? Yeah, well, well, it's interesting because. The evolutionary journey of humans is very intertwined with the evolution of our nutrition, because in order for an evolutionary change to be supported, you have to have the nutrition to support it. But also in order to be able to get the nutrition that this evolutionary stage needs, you have to, you have to have the, the capability and the intelligence to get that nutrition. So it's just like positive feedback cycle. Uh, especially with the development of our brains. As everyone knows, our brains are the biggest brains, <laughs> um, which is why we're more intelligent, more creative. Um, and so if if we tie the development of our, of our, if we tie our evolution and the development of our big brains to our nutrition and the evolution of our, our nutrition, it sort of makes sense as to why we got to where we are today. Um, because as our brains grew, we needed to find um, more dense sources of, of calories, right? We needed to find, so we started eating more animal foods. We started eating more things with more complex carbohydrates. Um, and so, but then we also had to learn how to process these things because, you know, you can't eat a potato raw. You have to learn how to process, to, to cook it, to, to grind it, you know, all wheat and, you know, breads and stuff like that, or flours, you know, you don't just eat it straight, you process it before, before you eat it. Um, but this is always to say that as we evolved, we always ate the whole food. We ate the bran, we ate the, the, the connective tissue of the animals. We ate the um, organ meat. Um, so we always ate the whole thing, but as our brains got bigger, our guts started to shrink in order to shunt more energy to our brains. And so now we needed things that were easily digestible, not just high sources of calories, but we needed things that were easily digestible because we don't have this long digestive tract in order to extract all the nutrients. 
So again, we had to find things that were that had dense nutritional value that we could process to make it easier to digest. Um, so like I said, cooking, grinding, soaking, fermenting, all of these things are, are tools that our ancestors used to process food in order to have get the most nutrition from the food with the with our smaller gut to get to our to feed our brains and to feed all the things that we needed to do. So come to the agricultural revolution. Well, wow, now it's not as hard. You know, we we can we've captured our food. We don't have to work for it anymore. This is great. We can we can feed more people. Um, but now we started limiting the amount of food that we the diversity of the foods that we ate. We stopped being um having all of these um that you know diverse foods moving around with the seasons um farming started disease and war and things like that as as land became um uh, consolidated and people started owning land and and you had to plant your seeds and then you know six months later is when you get the harvest so you have to protect all that stuff uh, and then the industrial revolution you take all of those things all of those products of the um, agricultural revolution, and now we can process them on a massive scale. And so processing food is what we've always wanted to do. We've wanted to process food to make it hyper palatable and, and really easy to, to digest. So it can, so we can absorb the most, um, nutrition as it's going through our bodies. But we've used our, our technology and our innovation and, and our intelligence, and we've totally and completely overshot because we crave sugary foods. That's an evolutionary um, thing that's conserved in us because we, we as, as we evolved, we evolved to look for the foods that have the most nutrient dense um, properties, the most glucose, the most fat, the most um, protein. And so now, you know, like, oh, look, we can make we can make flour and refined, re refined sugar that goes instantly into your bloodstream. Um, that's, that's like the easiest food ever to digest. Um, but it's not until recently that we've noticed, you know, we, we thought we were doing a good thing, but we've, now we know that the, the processing and the industrial revolution, we've, we've, we've strayed. Um, we needed to process food as our brains were, um, were developing and we got to the point where we were in equilibrium as when we were hunter gatherers. And then you know, we, we got way off, um, our food preparation and what we ate. So early man, early woman, they were eating off the land. They weren't getting foods that were super necessarily easy, rich in glucose on a regular basis. Right. And so it was more of a, maybe more of a luxury than a, um, than this thing that was like, readily available, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would maybe have get honey or you know syrup from trees and that was a rare occasion. Right. So they, we, that's one of the I guess this goes back to the argument between the paleo and the and the keto and all these food religions like oh no this was how we developed. Like I think early man and early woman they weren't keto, right? They weren't mm -hmm. carnivore. They weren't like one thing only. They were eating what was available. And yeah, when it was available, yeah, when it was available, right? Eating seasonally, and from what you're saying is that was kind of how we developed. Um, but then, as we became, as we started to grow, as we started to develop, as we started, our brain started to develop, and we started to say, "Hey, we can, we can make more of this, and we can farm this, and we can process, and we can make a lot more of it." it allowed for the expansion of humans right we started to really grow and expand but then they be created it created the next issue which is which meant we needed more food we need to get it mm -hmm. faster we needed to have it more consistently and so this in the in this rush to fill that void in that need we've actually created this problem because all those foods that we were really creating became more processed higher levels of carbohydrates and sugars the thing that mm -hmm. we were only getting before as a treat now we're getting it as a constant thing coming in. And that's mm -hmm. not really um, how our body was meant to adapt. Plus we're not as active as we used to be to burn mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. So this is where that evolutionary um, mismatch is really occurring. We're putting mm -hmm. more of what we used to get in a small amount 
and taking assuming more of that. And at the same time, we are less active and less able to mm -hmm. burn off a lot of that stuff as well. That's correct. And, and I think you were talking about big food um, before. Uh, big food is using scientific research to make their foods hyper palatable and hyper digestible because that is what our bodies crave. That it, that, that, you know, for our evolutionary journey, we were trying to get to really pal palatable food that we can digest quickly and get on our way. And so now 90% of the things on the grocery shelves have refined sugar and, ref and refined flour and refined oils. Um, and so th they're using their, you know, they're using science to make people real, you know, to make people sort of addicted to their food. They need more of this. They need more of this. They need more of this. Um, so I, I feel like big food has, has kind of taken advantage of our evolutionary impulses um, and taken it to the extreme in order to make money. Yeah. And this isn't, I mean, this has been going on for decades and decades and decades. I think there was a book that came out in the eighties. I think it was called the wellness revolution. And I think in one of the chapters in the book, they talk about the Oreo, you know, I forget which company makes Oreo cookies, but they, you know, he was consulting for them. Um, and he was there when they were doing, like they were bringing, they had all these test people in there and they're trying to go. So what are you waiting to see? Well, like which formula every but he likes the best. That's the formula to make. And they're like, no, that's not what we, we make. We make the formula that they eat the most of. Hmm. And so they want to make it hyper palatable, but they also want to make, they want to be aware of not just which one tastes the best, but mm -hmm. which one causes the brain to crave more. Mm -hmm. So I do. Yeah. I, I totally agree with what you're saying is, yeah, we're taking advantage of you know what the what the brain and the body is really wants, which is hey, I want it to taste good, and I and I want and big food wants us to crave whatever they make because that's how mm -hmm. we make more money. The problem mm -hmm. is most of those foods, um, some version of a of a Franken food, ver and we're further and further away from whole food based foods. Right. Well, I mean, we, we're talking about now. The processing of food is is what it's gaining for us. Like it's gaining hyper uh, palatability and more calories and all of these things. But another thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is what we're losing, and that's fiber. Um, like I said, we used to eat everything. We you know we we ate the the entire vegetable and unless the parts that were poisonous, we you know we take those out. We we'd eat the skins, we'd eat the rinds, um, and we'd also you know like, like I said, we eat the whole animal too. Um, but our, the fiber intake was so, and maybe, I don't know, I don't know. There's so many different levels, three times higher, five times higher than it is now, 10 times higher than it is now, depending on wh where you look, um, that fiber, not only is it important, um, to, to slow down the, the entry of glucose and things into our, into our bloodstream, but it's so important to help our gut microbiome, the good, the good gut microbiome to help us. Cause I, I feel like, uh, in a way our gut micro microbiome has helped us compensate a little bit for the shortening of our gut because it, it actually takes the things that we haven't digested yet and it digests it and uses it for itself. But then it also gives us things back, you know, short change fatty acids and things like that, that, it, that are more and more being found to, really, I mean, the, the gut microbiome, I feel like is the hot item right now in terms of nutrition and, and what it does for us. And so the, the loss of fiber in our diet is almost equally as important, I think, as the gain in hyper palatability and, and calories. Yeah. And I, I would say from that, not only do we, do we gain, we gain hyper palatability and not, and not only do we lose the fiber from our plant-based foods, we're also losing the micronutrient content of those oh, foods. And, yes. and for sure, you know, we, we put stuff back, but I think we, <laughs> we are so naive to believe that, oh, if we just put these individual vitamins back in and fortify this food, it's, it, it's going to wind up being the same thing it was before. And we, and I just don't think it's true, right? It's the old yeah. um, chicken noodle soup, right? 
like, okay, chicken noodles, people get better when they eat chicken noodle soup. So let's just break it all down, find out what the magic ingredient was, and we'll market it and sell it. And they couldn't figure mm -hmm. it out because it wasn't the individual nutrients. Mm -hmm. It's the synergistic effect exactly. of that. Same in the food. There's, I guarantee you there's things in, in that whole plant that we still don't even know what mm -hmm. it is. And yeah. so we don't, you know, we're not making it. We don't know. We're always finding out new things. Hey, there's this chemical in this thing. And this is something we're making, a, you know, into a vitamin or a drug or something. Or a supplement. But, yeah. Or a supplement, right? Like you see the, oh, we found this in the depths of Amazon. I'm the only <laughs> one who's ever found it. Right. But right. there's, but yeah, there's that, something. The context, the context in which you, when you're eating food, the context of the other foods around it, what you're eating it with, um, all of that stuff affects the nu nutritional value of the food that you're eating. Yeah, and the energy of the food, right? There's something mm -hmm. to be said about l food in its more live state than its than its deader state, right? It's probably not great English, but I think there's <laughs> something to to food in its natural state. I mean, it's one of the principles that um, I talk about on here. I mean, there's a lot of food religions out there today, especially in the, this health and wellness mm -hmm. space. Like we. I say this almost probably every podcast, but I think it's so important. We argue with each other about which whole food diet is the best. And I think it's the most asinine argument that we're having <laughs> because we're, it's like we circled the wagons and we're shooting in at each other when the reality is like all of those whole foods are probably really good. And, you know, right. eating the same one day in, day out, probably not as good. It's having some variety, right? Mm -hmm. Having a variety. I mean, we I think we, generally believe that the more variety we have from our food, the healthier our gut biome mm -hmm. is going to be. But with your background, I think it's important to ask this question, especially with these food religions that are out there, like there's the, you have the, the carnivore community talking about the poisonous, how plants are poisonous. They're not good for you. You don't need the fiber to be yeah. healthy. I don't know that it's true, but <laughs> what have you learned about that? I, I think my argument is any change in, from an unhealthy diet to a whole mm -hmm. food diet is probably going to show benefit. If you're right. struggling with your current diet and you change to a different whole food diet, there's probably going to be some mm -hmm. benefit. Yeah. But do you, what's your, what's your opinion on the, the whole fiber story? Yeah, well, it's funny. I read on, uh, I wish I could go back and find it. It was on Instagram. Someone's like, we need to stop fighting about what foods we should eat because we all agree about the foods we shouldn't eat. So mm -hmm. before, we, before we're going to get everybody on our bandwagon for keto or paleo or whatever, we have to get people to stop eating what they're eating already. So why can't we all come together and, and as, a, as a united front so we don't confuse people and tell them what they shouldn't eat, and then tell them they have all these other options they can try. Um, because there really isn't a paleo diet. And there are paleo diets, but there's not just one paleo diet, one size fits all. Because humans are adaptable. He, you know, we lived in the Arctic and we lived in the in the desert. And we thrived in both of those places and we ate completely different diets. Um, you know, maybe people who lived in the rainforest may be 80% plants and 10 20% uh, animals and people who lived in the arctic was the complete opposite you know maybe 20% plants only during during the summer season and the rest they ate animals um and then there's everything in between you know all of the the climates from from the arctic to the rainforest there's so many climates and there's so many different places that have a variety of foods, a variety of different foods at different times of year. Um, and we all, we ate all of it. We ate whatever was there and we ate the whole, the, we ate it all. We ate the whole food. If the plant was poisonous, we figured out how to de to detoxify it before we ate it. That's what processing does. You know, if something's poisonous, cook it. It's not poisonous anymore. Now you can eat it, you know? Um, we figured out those things. We figured out how to make what the environment, what nature provided us in the region that we lived in, how we figured out how to prepare those foods, what ratios to eat those foods to, to be healthy. And, and actually, 
we didn't even necessarily have to figure it out. We evolved in these places. And so we evolved taking what nature gave us. And that was whole foods. Yeah. I mean, that's what we lived on. I, and I think, I guess one of the, my pet peeves today, especially within the health and wellness industry is we're looking at a lot of things that, and we're, we're looking at certain deficiencies and we're like lab, like, Oh, everybody needs this. Everybody needs to be taking that. Vitamin D is a great example. Everybody's deficient in vitamin D. Um, well, wait a minute. We didn't, vitamin D is not found in food, really. I mean, mm -hmm. there's very little vitamin D in food. How did we ever make it through the last couple thousand years, right? If we weren't taking vitamin D supplementation, <laughs> right? Right. So- how do we how do we write that ship? Like we're looking at um, everybody's vitamin D deficient. Everybody needs fish oil. Like yet evolutionarily, the people that were growing that were growing in the in the in the equator area in that region, they weren't eating cold water fish. How did they ever survive? How did the people in a, in the northern and southern areas, the po closer to the poles, how did they not have autoimmune conditions and be chronically ill if they didn't have vitamin D? How do you how do you how do you square that uh, evolutionarily, or are we just looking at things maybe incorrectly? We're looking at the deficiency as the problem versus the deficiency should be telling us a better story. Right, right. It's it's rather than supplementing back what we're missing, we need to go back and restore what we were doing before those things went missing. Um, because it's the, the context in which we eat all these things, like we were talking about before. I mean, if you give someone a vitamin D supplement, they're not getting vitamin D from exposure to the sun. There are so many other things that the sun does for our bodies, like we talked about with sleep, that, oh, well, I have vitamin D supplements. I don't have to go out in the sun. I mean, th there's so many side effects to just treating treating one condition with one um, product or you know, one mineral, one one amino acid, because that's not how we ate. That's not how we we took in things from our environment. We didn't take so, it in piecemeal. So let's, because I want to get into the other couple other pieces, and we're, we're as I said, we were going to chew through time probably. So. Yeah. <laughs> The foundational con thought process in the book, like what's the lesson? And obviously everybody, we want everybody to go out and the book and, and, and read it, but foundationally, what are the dietary recommendations that you, that you kind of talk about in the book, like two or three key concepts that you want people to get so that they're yeah. eating closer to their evol evolutionary being. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them is uh, we've we've hit this with the, with over the head so many times. Eat whole foods, don't eat processed foods. Um, and hopefully, if more and more people demand, you know, stop buying all these processed foods and start buying whole foods, there'll be more supply. And you know, hopefully, the food companies are listening, but maybe not. Um, so that's the first one. Um, the second one is eat more fiber, for sure. Um, and the third one is. Anything that is foreign to our bodies, like trans fats, um, artificial sweeteners, artificial colors, artificial flavors, our bodies don't know how to handle those. And we don't know what those things are doing to our bodies. You know, they might be environmental they, um, environmental influences on certain chronic health diseases. Um, so, so those are like kind of my big three. Whole foods, increase your fiber. Um, well, also whole, eat more whole foods and eat a lot less ultra processed food. <laughs> Um, so that, that those kind of go together, um, more fiber. And then if it wasn't around 200 years ago, don't, I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> and that's how, I mean, I, I eat things that have artificial colors and flavors in them, but I am conscious, you know, not to overeat them. You know, that I have a, I have a, a meal now and then that has these things, but I don't beat myself up over it. I just make sure that it's only once in a while. Yeah. I. 
I think you'll agree with what my philosophy is. I tell my patients that hey, you eighty percent of the time you want to have good habits, and fifteen to twenty percent of the time you want to mm-hmm. you want to have a few bad behaviors. That's what keeps people happy. So right. if you're if eighty percent of your meals are whole food based, uh, and I would add to what you said, I am buy locally in season mm-hmm. as much as mm-hmm. possible. Because even if it's a whole food, if it's coming from somewhere else, it probably, when we talk about toxicity of foods, my opinion, this may not be fully correct, but if we're pulling plants before they're ripened so that we can ship them across, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're forced ripening them so they look good in the grocery store, they're still probably loaded they're probably at a higher toxicity level, in my opinion, because plants are pretty smart. They they make foods not palatable and not and a little bit more toxic when they're not ripe because mm-hmm. we don't want it, they, they don't want they don't want to be eaten yet. All right. They don't right, they want right. to be able to spread their seeds when they're ready. So I think whole food based, don't worry about the food religion wars. Um, eat a, mm-hmm. eat eat local when possible and eat in season when possible. And then don't yeah. beat yourself up if you have some. Um, if you want to drink a little bit of alcohol, you drink a little bit of alcohol, but, but if it's mm-hmm. a habit that you're doing all the time, it's, you're probably going to pay the price. But mm-hmm. I think too many people try and l- the stress of trying to live a perfect dietary mm-hmm. life is mm-hmm. probably more problematic. So, especially living in our culture, because like you said, living, having healthy food choices is counterculture. So there's not a lot of support for you when you go out to dinner and there's nothing for you to eat you know, but you want to be with your friends, it's okay to have something that's not on your diet. Um, so it, it, the culture needs to change to support, to be more supportive of people who want to make that change. Yeah. All right. So we talked about, we talked about nutrition. <laughs> we talked about sleep. What's the next big topic? In the Our world? next big topic is work and rest. So is that one topic or two? It's the same. It's, it's kind of, in, it's in the same part because, um, they, they, kind of do, they, they kind of go together. It's yeah, it's yeah. the balance between the two. So what did what's from an evolutionary standpoint? Let's talk about that. What did we used to do? What are we doing now that's problematic? And what's the recommendation? Okay. Um, so I think what people think of when people think of hunter gatherers or cavemen or days or whatever, they think of hardship and lack. And it must have been, they must have worked so hard to to get by when really people studying the the hunter-gatherer groups that are in the fringes, they were pushed out of the fertile parts of the world into these very inhospitable places. And they really studied them and they were able to maintain their nutritional, you know, sustain their nutrition and, and be healthy in terms of be healthier than their, um, you know, pastoral, their, their cattle um, raising neighbors on maybe 15 to 20 hours of work per week. Um, and, and then they were able to enjoy things. They were able to um, visit and sing and dance and, and be with community, um, teach the young ones, tell stories, that kind of thing. So I think what people imagine hunter gatherers are like, oh man, they work so hard. And, and yes, they did have to work hard, but they didn't work all the time and they only worked in order to, to meet their needs. They didn't work to get a Ferrari. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they didn't, they met their needs and had very limited materialism. Um, I think a farmer, like a very early farmer would have more stuff than an entire group of hunter gatherers. Um, materialism and things just weren't important to them. Um, so I think there's several things that are, I mean, you can probably tell right now the things that are going wrong now is that we have this culture of work for work's sake. We don't just work to meet our needs. We work because we've twisted it in our, in our heads that our work is part of our worth. Um, our work, we have to work in order to afford these things that companies are telling us we need to be happy. Um, we need to work so... Um, I don't know to to fill to fill something in our in our lives that's that's missing, um, and I, I feel like the United States, especially, I think more than fifty percent of the population works more than fifty hours a week, or more than forty hours a week. 
Um, and that's just horrible. <laughs> um, and, and working 80 hours a week, people are like, oh, I'll get so much more done if I just work longer. Um, but there are studies, the, the more you work, the more overworked you are, the less productive you are, the less efficient you are. And overwork takes a huge toll on your health. It's not just um, not sleeping and not eating correctly, but when you don't take time to rest and you just work, work, work all the time, um, your body goes into a state of um, kind of fight or flight um, in order to maintain it. So, so working really long hours, working for more than just what our needs are. Um, and that's not to say there are some people who work so hard and still can't meet their needs. I, I don't want, mean to say that, you know, we just have to work as, you know, we have to work until we meet our needs and that's it. Um, but it's a mindset. It's, it's more of a mindset. Um, and then not really having much stuff, um, living more minimalistically. So you don't have to pay for the stuff. You don't have to pay for maintenance of the stuff. You don't have to pay to store the stuff because our houses have gotten bigger. Fewer people live in them and we still need to buy storage facilities to keep all of our stuff. Um, so that that's kind of the, the difference between you know how we how we evolved to work and how we're working now, um, and we've already talked about how hunter gatherers are always in the present moment, and that's a way that they viewed the world. They had a very different concept of time than we did. They viewed time as more circular. Um, they had this immediate return economy, which made us you know whatever they needed, they went and got and they used it right. So we have a, a very linear um, t concept of time and our economy is delayed return economy. We plant seeds now and reap the benefits later. So just the way that our economy is set up, you know, we work and get our paycheck next month. We are very, we have become very future oriented. We live, we don't live in the present moment. We live in the future. And so that is another way in which I think um, is a difference between how a hunter gatherer would work, would approach work and rest and how we approach work and rest in the modern world is we are not in the present moment. We're always worried about the future. We, we're always worried about what's coming around the bend. And they were just happy with what, what nature gave them and lived in the present moment and had less, a lot less stress. So those are kind of the, the two sides of the coin that I see. Yeah. And I, I, I would add one caveat to that. I think we also worry, we spend too much time worrying about the future. We spend too much time mm. worrying about what happened in the past this is true. And, and, and we don't, and we don't live in the future in the moment. And we, we all do this, right? We are in this, we need it today mentality, mm -hmm. right? That's why Amazon's so successful because I can order right. something now and it'll be here before the end of the night, maybe, or first thing tomorrow morning. And we pay later. But because we're paying later, the do, the bill comes later, and so mm -hmm. now I've got to pay for all these things I got, and um, and we're so busy trying to match up to the lives of the you know the Instagrammer or the Facebooker yep, the or whatever. On TV. Yep, that we that we miss that maybe the greatest gift we have is the people that are around us, and that's probably mm -hmm. where the hunter gatherers probably did a much better job of with their life and lifestyle is in people and the relationships were so mm -hmm. much more important because they didn't have a tv they didn't have all these other things it was the interaction with other people was there was their instagram mm -hmm. right exactly not the, not the interface with instagram and in your, your phone <laughs> but the <laughs> actual integration right so hey right. i'm gonna go check in with joe they didn't go on their phone or their computer they actually went and talked to joe right so <laughs> it was it was a different experience um, but there's, yeah, there's more pressure and there's more, there's a standard to have a higher, uh, I got to have the newest car. I got to have the newest, the biggest house. I think we, and I think we all go through that ego phase to some degree where we want to, I want to show everybody how successful I am with stuff. And really maybe we should be measuring the success with how healthy are, are my kids, my family, how healthy are those relationships? How mm -hmm. happy are they? Right. Uh, well, and then, and then if we're if we're more focused on that, we if we're not worried about how we look, we're worried about more about the people around us. Our community becomes more important too because we're not in competition with them anymore, mm -hmm. you know. And we have more time to to spend together. So 
I think you have um, talking about community and how hunter gatherers, the, the connections with people are so important. Um, the next series, so this is actually a series of books. Um, we, we kind of cover the basic needs in this first one. But the next book that will come out, it spends a lot of time on social groups and connection and, and interactions um, and how critical that is for our health. Um, and so, but, but like we said, everything's connected in order to have more time for our family, for our, for our um, community, for our connections, we have to work less, you know, and to work less, we have to be happy with owning less and maybe, maybe not, you know, living the high life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so all, all of these things are connected. All right. So we talked about that one. What's the last big point in the book? Yeah. So the with? last big point is nature our in our relationship with nature. Um, and at first it was interesting because that that's the, the part that I was the most interested in writing. It's the first part that I wrote. Um, and I, and to me, I feel like it's, it might seem a little bit like, Oh, sleep, work, uh, nutrition, work, nature, some, you know, some people might think that one does not really fit with the other ones. But to me, I feel like nature is the foundation of all the other ones, because that is where we evolved. We evolved in our natural habitat. And we are the only species on the planet who does not live in our natural habitat. And yet, we, we haven't gone extinct yet. Um, so I, I feel like nature is where we evolved. And so that's where we need to kind of return to in order to um, to help our health and well-being. Um, because nature is provides everything we need. It, you know, we, we're no longer associated with the, you know, obtaining food. But if you think about like, oh, you're eating a hamburger, every single thing in that was provided by the earth in some way. I mean, there might be some artificial stuff in there too. But, you know, there was a cow that was born and raised and fed its whole life. You know, there was grain that was watered and was in the sun and it was there all, all summer and then it was harvested. Um, the earth provides that for us. The, the earth provides our nutrition. The earth provides, and, and because, you know, our, the, our work, at least our work when we were hunter-gatherers was to get our nutrition and then have fun and then enjoy life um, in nature. I mean, nature provided that too. So I, I feel like in a way, at least for me, people might have different interpretations, but nature is almost the linchpin of, of this book because we are nature. We evolved in nature. Um, and nature is as important to our survival. We might not think we need it, but it, but it is really important to our survival. Um, and so we talk a lot about how we used to be connected to, to nature and how ways we can become more connected with nature. We talk about how there are more and more studies now that show the correlation between being in nature and stress reduction and immunity, increased immunity and increased, you know, better mental health. There, there's so many things that, um, that kind of dovetail together um, when, when you're out in nature and out living in your natural environment. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important. And I, and I grew up like in the mountains and being outside and doing all those things. But then as you become, you get into your career and you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're coaching your kids and you're doing all those things um, and you're busy and you're working and you're doing things and you're over busy. Me too. Um, mm -hmm. And I think one of the greatest things, and I've, I've said this on the podcast a bunch of times and a lot of people are anti hunting or whatever, but I got into shooting a bow and then got into bow hunting and I got into shooting the bow initially as a, just a thing to get away from like, just kind of calm my mind. I'm not the person mm -hmm. who's going to sit in the middle of the floor and hum and, and, you know, <laughs> do, you know, whatever, like panting or anything like that. But for me to just go and practice shooting the bow was mm -hmm. good for my brain. Cause you had to focus on that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then when I started, I said, all right, now I'll go, I'll do some archery hunting. And I got it out in the woods. I was like, like, I was not used to being alone again. Like, and as a kid, I did this all the mm -hmm. time, but as an adult, I wasn't like, I would do it if I was doing an adventure race or a triathlon. Yeah, I'm by myself, but that's different. I wasn't really 
in nature. I was in nature, but not in nature, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But then when I got out and I would start to sit in a tree stand for a couple, I would get super edgy and anxious. Mm -hmm. Like I got stuff to do. I got to go do stuff. Like when it was through that first year of trying fighting myself to stay in the woods um, that I realized this was more probably therapy for my emotional fitness than anything else. Oh, I bet. And, I, and I had a friend of mine who was like, I could never do that. I'm like, yeah, if you can't sit by yourself in the, in the woods and just observe what's going on in nature, you need to go sit in the woods for eight <laughs> hours because you, you don't pay attention. Like you don't, you're not aware, like we're in, in outside, but we're not in nature. Like right. I, 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 one day I was, in, I was on a tr hunting trip and I'm sitting in the freezing cold and I'm watching a squirrel and that squirrel is jamming a nut in between this bee and a branch. <laughs> and I'm like any other time, I, you know, if you, most people wouldn't have watched it. But then once I was watching that and watched him for a while, well, you know, I'm out there for eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. I really realized how busy he was. He, in every crook of every tree where there was a Y wow. in the tree, there was something jammed in that little thing. <laughs> I never would have noticed that. But that is, yeah. I think that's what you're trying to, what you're trying to say is we need to get, not just get outside. That's important. Mm -hmm. But get into nature, get in, see what's going on in your environment, pay attention to the birds and the noise they make, the, the sounds, mm -hmm. what the squirrel's doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is going on? We've become, because we're so used to looking at computer screens and phones and social media that we, we don't even know what's going on around us. Mm -mm. And I even, and you talked about the food and the burger, we are so disconnected from our food supply. You know, it, it, it amazes me when people are say like, like, oh, would you go? I can't believe you'd kill an animal. I'm like, did you eat a burger? Like, did you, mm -hmm. where do you think all of that food came from? Or the person who says, well, I'm a vegan. I don't like to kill anything. Are, are you serious? Do you know how many organisms died in the process of making your, whatever you're eating? We, of course, mm -hmm. something's dying, but in, our hunter gatherer, the early people, we were we were aware of what was going on. We were eating the whole species, like the whole piece. We were we weren't working against the environment. And I think no. that's one of the beauty of the of I the mean, people who are, especially the outdoorsmen. Yeah. We're not trying to destroy the environment. We're trying to mm -hmm. nurture wildlife. We're trying to nurture the land because we want it to be there. So that we can us. live off it, right? To sustain it needs to be us. sustainable. Yeah, I feel like not only did I mean yes, hunter gatherers they weren't tree huggers. You know, they cut down trees if they needed it. They hunted animals. They you know took all the berries off a off a plant. But they res they respected what they hunted and gathered. They they had this reverence for the natural world. Um, and B like like we just said they knew how to use the land in a way that was sustainable um, so that it would, it would provide, it would continue to provide for their, their descendants. Um, so th those, those are the two that, you know, really um, important things is the, the respect, the connection and the sustainability that, that I like to, to, to kind of bring out. And I think it's the more time we actually spend in nature, right? Engulfed in nature, so much good for our physical mm -hmm. and our emotional well-being. And if you improve your emotional well-being, you're reducing that stress load. If you're reducing that stress load and calming the sympathetic nervous system, now you're going to sleep better. Now you're going to digest better. Now mm -hmm. you're going to feel and function better. So all of this stuff goes together. And that's why I think when we when we see people with health issues, especially chronic health issues, like they, they want to know, how, what do I need to take to fix my thyroid? What do I mm -hmm. need to do to fix my SIBO? Um, 
that's where I, in in my book, the thyroid debacle, we don't have a supplemental strategy in there. People have said, how come you don't put what, sup, what are the best supplements? Because I don't want you to buy a bottle of supplements. What I want you to do is look at your, what I call your fitness factors, figure out where you have, what are the weakest pieces? Is it your physical fitness, mm -hmm. your emotional fitness, your dietary fitness? Like where's the weaknesses? Mm -hmm. And instead of spending- start? Yeah. Instead of waste, wasting money on supplementation to try and manage like greenwash your health, let's focus on the foundational concepts first. And if you're working on those foundational concepts, it is getting you back to your evolution, your, how we should have be, we evolved and how we should still be evolving. Those mm -hmm. are the foundational concepts, but we've gotten so far away from those things that the reason we have chronic health issues is more because we're so, so, so disconnected with these from these foundational concepts mm -hmm. that contribute to health and well-being. That there's no way we're going to get that healthy with a bottle of supplements or ten right. bottles of supplements or well, the next we're, magic treatment. Yeah, we're we're so busy. We want the quick fix. We don't want something that's going to take time. We don't want something that we're going to have to change. We just want to take something so we can keep doing our lives. Um, and that, you know, we need to s slow down as a society and we need to to start listening to what's really important and to listen to our, what our bodies need. Perfect. So I think that's a good place to, to, to end this conversation. It's in, we're, we're at that hour and a half point. It went pretty quick. Um, it did. So tell everybody where the, what the book is and yeah. where they can hear more about you, where they can get the book uh, and where they can maybe find out about the next book. Yeah. Yeah. So the book is on the origin of being understanding the science of evolution to enhance your quality of life. Um, it is available on any online retailer, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, those kinds of places. Um, and we have a website, www.ontheoriginofbeing.com. Uh, there's a link on that website to send you to, to buy something. You can learn more about Luke and I. Um, there's some excerpts from the book you can read. Uh, and then we're, I'm also pretty active. Um, my, the most active platform that I'm on is Instagram. Um, and Instagram is at ontheoriginofbeing. Um, and so that has a lot of videos, a lot of um, little little tidbits from the book, quotes from the book, um, other, what other people are doing. Um, so I'm really trying to, to, um, curate a collection of, so people like go and look at our Instagram feed, they'll kind of get a feel for what the book is and maybe take, take some, some tips away with them. Um, so I'm also, that's also at on the origin of being on Facebook. I am on Instagram, um, Jenny powers and not, sorry, not in, Instagram, sorry, LinkedIn. If LinkedIn's your thing, uh, I'm Jenny Powers on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I hope I hope people are in, inspired to to check it out. Awesome. Well, it was great having the conversation with you. I think everything you're you're talking about in the book fits really well with the concept of what I think we should be doing from a functional medicine standpoint, which is get back to the foundational concepts. Mm -hmm. exactly. Just the things you're talking about is hey, these are the things that we've done through our development, our, have how the things that have helped us evolve, and we still need to be doing those things. And the further mm -hmm. we get away from these foundational concepts, it's no wonder that we have more chronic health issues, more chronic illness, um, and life expectancy gets shorter, and we have a bigger and bigger disease span than an mm -hmm. actual health span. So uh, I, totally Jenny, agree. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Great conversation. And uh, love when you get the next book out, we'll do this again. Okay. Cool. That would, that would be great. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Take care.